Dragon Quest VIII, Journey of the Cursed King, is from beginning to end a masterpiece. If you're a fan of RPGs, it really is the perfect specimen. Dragon Quest VIII is the first game in the series to be released after Enix purchased RPG juggernaut Squaresoft. And I was somewhat curious as to what the impact of this on the series would be. Although Dragon Quest is the top-selling series of RPGs in Japan, hell, it's practically a religion there, it never became this hugely overproduced phenomenon like Final Fantasy, the Dragon Quest series, from the originals on the NES up to Part 7 on PlayStation, they were always done by a small development team in a basement. Despite coming out late in the PlayStation era, 7's graphics looked like a first-generation game. It's safe to say that Breath of Fire 3 looked more advanced, and they didn't heavily use CGI cutscenes, and there were no voice samples or anything. With the merger, I wondered, would Dragon Quest continue to be a low-budget series done in a basement, or would it go to a full-blown big budget like Final Fantasy? It only takes one look at the game to know it's a big budget title. It has some of the most beautiful graphics on the PlayStation 2. But rather than go for the sort of CGI nightmare that Final Fantasy had become, it adopts a cell shaded look. The graphics are supremely detailed, especially the characters, as they are all shaded perfectly to create depth. I really wish more games had used this style. But then came my other concern. Is it still going to play like Dragon Quest? Well, damn, it sure does. Even if you had missed out on the 16- and 32-bit games like many people did, the game's mechanics and progression is instantly recognizable. Enix seems to know exactly what to keep from the 8-bit era and what to improve upon or replace. The game has a real sense of size, too. The game world is absolutely huge, and something as simple as traveling from one town to another becomes a journey, as you really expect it would. You're constantly finding new areas tucked away, hidden treasure chests, capturable enemies, and other goodies. Playing the game is a real wonder, just running across plains through forests, sailing on the seas, with the game's epic soundtrack swelling in the background. One strange thing about the game is that in the U.S. we actually got a better version of the game than in Japan. While it is true that many of the classic sound effects were taken out, we got voice acting, which wasn't even in the Japanese release. The voice acting is surprisingly good, and was done by a group of British actors, giving the entire thing the pseudo-medieval feel that the series is somewhat known for. The voices perfectly match the characters. I especially liked Yangus's Cockney accent. The characters themselves are really well developed, except of course for the hero, whom you develop with your own imagination. The storyline is epic in its scope. As the game starts, the hero is traveling with a small toad-like creature, King Trode, a king whose entire castle had been cursed. He was turned into the toad-like creature, and his daughter, Princess Medea, became a horse. The only person to be unaffected was the main character, who was a guard at the castle. Also traveling with you is Yangus, a former thief whose life was once saved by the hero, and he now expresses his gratitude by becoming his personal bodyguard. The group are chasing Duel Magus, an evil court jester type that has obtained a staff of immense power, and is the one that created the curse. You find out throughout the game that he is the vessel of a greater evil, Rapthorn, who is looking to re-enter the world by murdering certain people who were the descendants of the ones who sealed him away. In some ways, it's a little bit like the Legend of Zelda linked to the past, and the maidens who were descended from the sages. Well, anyway, the story is told beautifully, and unfolds at a natural pace, and the great animation and acting really bring the characters to life. There are moments of great humor, particularly the way that King Trode and Yangus interact with each other, and moments of great sadness also. The gameplay is a blast. In a lot of ways, it's the tried-and-true Dragon Quest formula, but there's enough stuff added to keep you excited. I particularly like the alchemy pot, which lets you mix items with each other to create other items. If you know what you're doing, you can get really powerful weapons early, or create powerful items to use in battle or for healing out of the simplest items. There's also your typical monster training mode and the prerequisite super hard extra dungeon to play after you beat the game. There's just so much to do. Collect monster coins, make items in the alchemy pot, take part in the black market trading, help a fat asshole prince in a rite of initiation, help a king with his grief, travel into a world of dreams, 
Dragon Quest VIII fucking has it all, bitches. Oh, hell yeah. Now, another great thing about the game is something that I think every RPG should have. Different people can play the game different ways. As your characters level, you gain skill points that you can put into weapon skills to get new attacks, and each character has the options of several weapon types. You can make the hero use spears, and Jessica use daggers, Yangus uses scythes, and Angela using bows. Or maybe you don't like that. Maybe you want the hero to use a boomerang, Jessica could use a whip, Yangus could use a hammer, and Angelo could use a sword. Or you could have all four fight without weapons, as there is an unarmed skill set for each character. There are also character-specific traits. You could level up the hero's courage or Jessica's sex appeal. Yeah, you heard me. Even the enemies want a boner. Dragon Quest VIII is the most satisfying RPG I've ever played on every level. And when it's all said and done, and you're watching the credits roll, you really feel like you accomplished something grand. The game gives you a sense of real accomplishment, and it has one of the best endings ever in a game. If you have a PlayStation 2 and the willingness to go on grand adventure... You owe it to yourself to get this game, and that's why it's number one. Well, folks, that's it. That's my list. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you didn't, well, then to hell with you, really. I don't mind if you want to post your own lists or tell me what your favorites are, because everybody's top ten is going to be different. But I really don't want to hear what my list should be. If you have such a problem with the way I put it together, well, I have an ass and a crazy straw. Get cracking.